Uh, right, so my name is Cedric. Um, I did my PhD with uh, Yasha Yashberg. Um, I was working on syntactic and compact topology, and then I moved to Leipzig, and then I was working with Astor uh, Pedi, did some more analysis. And uh, yeah, this year, hopefully, I'll do both. Um, so on Monday, we had a very nice talk by uh, Bahar, who introduced um, kind of the basic objects in syntactic and compact geometry. And now Etida told us a bit more about symplectic geometry. So I'm going to tell us a bit more, tell you a bit more about contact geometry. So um, remember that, so we take some odd dimensional manifold M and a contact structure is just some hyperplane field, right? So at each point you have a hyperplane in a tangent space. And what it means to be contact is that C can be written at least locally and in this talk we'll assume globally as the kernel of a one form alpha. Um, such that if you compute alpha wedge d alpha to the n, um, that thing does not vanish. I understand you mean uh, m Okay. What am I sure of? No, 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 it's okay. Did I already? Oh, that's fine. <laughs> right, so that thing is a volume form. So um, the really important thing to remember, um, if you're not familiar with contact structure, is that it's a hyperplane field with some conditions. I'm not going to use explicitly any of these conditions in this talk, so it should not be worrying. All right. So in this context, um, of course, what is a symmetry of that type of thing? It's a contact homomorphism. Um, and well, that would just be you know, some diffeomorphism. And uh, that just pushes forward to itself. So it maps that hyperplane, hyperplane field onto itself. Or equivalently, um, if we fix some contact from alpha, it means that it pulls back alpha to some multiple of itself, right? Because it has to define the same kernel. And that multiple I will call C of phi. So if C of phi is just some function. All right, so what are we interested in studying? Uh, we're going to be looking at a group G, which will be um, the contact homomorphism group of M, and a bit more precisely, um, so it will be. So we're going to look at compactly supported contact homomorphisms, right? M could be open, and we're going to look at the identity component of that thing, right? So now that group has a universal cover, G tilde, um, and how can we describe that thing? That is just going to be so that's kind of the usual. Uh, construction of universal cover. So this is going to be a set of contact isotopies. So families indexed by time of, con of contact morphisms starting at the identity. And then I'm going to mod this out by operation of homotopy relative to the endpoints. Right. So this is what we're looking at. So of course, we're interested in studying that because it's the, the symmetry group of, of, of the, the symmetry group of the structure we'd like to study. All right, so now what is um, the tangent space with that? Uh, so either of these spaces. Um, so it will be a space of vector fields, right? Because it's a subspace of diffeomorphisms. A bit more precisely, it will be the set of vector fields X and M. That's the lead derivative of the contact form that we fixed. It's just some multiple of alpha. So this is a multiple for some function mu uh, from M to R. Right, so that thing is um, the algebra of these things. And um, it turns out that since we're, uh, since C is contact, that thing is actually in one-to-one -one correspondence to just a set of functions on M. So how does this work? Um, well, given any vector field X, I can just simply map it to the function H of X, which is, well, you have a vector field and a one form, you can feed one to the other and you get just a function. Right, and now, of course, this is something you can always do with uh, anything, but the, uh, the point of contact geometry is that there's actually a way to go back. I don't want to explicitly write it, but actually this map is indeed one-to-one. -one. So what, what this means is that actually, if you have so a tangent vector somewhere to that space, um, that thing is uniquely determined by the component that is transversal to C, right? So in the picture, you would have uh, a point P, and here you have C at the point P. This is our vector X at the point P. It has some component which is kind of in a complement of C, and then it has a uh, component in C. It turns out that um, the data of this vector is equivalent to kind of the alpha length of this thing here. 
And this is what this correspondence tells us. And these functions here are called uh, contact Hamiltonians. Um, they're called like that because, well, symplectic geometry, sorry, sorry, contact geometry is secretly just equivalent symplectic geometry. And it turns out that if you take this picture and you equivalentize everything, you like, kind of lift everything to the symplectization, that function will become the Hamiltonian in the sense of symplectic geometry that generates this motion. Uh, this, uh, well, that, yeah, that, that thing. All right. Uh, and now, well, what's the time dependent version of that? So this was at the level of the Lie algebra. What happens if we integrate all of that to take this contact isotopy into account? Um, well, we just get that the set of contact isotopies should be in a correspondence with the set of time dependent functions on M. Right. Okay. And Secretly, I'm going to remove this 0, 1, and I'm going to put an S1 instead. So now what I wrote is not really true anymore, uh, but that would be more useful in the end. And also, anyways, we're doing things up to homotopy. So that's actually not a huge deal. So in what follows, I will consider periodic functions on N instead. All right, so now what do we do with all of this? Um, so I want to define a relation on, um, on, on this universal cover here that will want to be an order. And sometimes it will be, sometimes not. And I will explain this. So here is a relation. So we say that some contact isotopy phi of t is larger equal to the identity if, um, so if the, the, the function that maps t to the image at time t of a point p goes in the positive direction of c. So what this means is that you have some point p it moves along with our isotopy, gets to by T of P. At each point, of course, there is some contact plane living there. And um, right, so since we have this one form here that's globally defined, it defines everywhere a positive and a negative side to C, with the side where alpha is positive. And I just want this isotopy to always move in the positive direction. So the equivalence class of a particular contact isotopy is larger than the identity if that moves in the positive direction. What this means in terms of these contact Hamiltonians I defined there is simply that the associated Hamiltonian is positive uh, as a function from n cross s12. Okay, and now, well, definition. So I said this thing wants to be an order. So we say that um, our manifold MC is orderable if this thing is a non-trivial partial order. Right, so if you have two elements, uh, such that one is, so element one is larger than element two, but it's not true that element one is also smaller than element two. And then we have um, some order on, on this group. All right, so uh, I should give an example. I should probably, at the beginning, have given an example of contact manifold. I guess Bahar gave a bunch of in her, in her talk. I'm going to take the most ridiculous example, which is just the circle with the kernel of dt. Since that's an extremely trivial contact manifold. That thing turns out to be orderable. Just you know, think about it for a second. If you always move in the positive direction of S1, uh, basically, it's clear that this defines an order. Just look at what happens on the, on the universal cover of, of S1. It's all right. Other examples of things which are orderable but harder to show are so there's a uh, standard contact space, uh, contact hidden space, there are the projective spaces, there are like, more generally the length spaces. Um, non examples include so we know that the higher dimensional spheres um, with their standard contact structure are not orderable. And then we have some more examples. Um, but the point I'm trying to make here is that, so proving that something is not orderable um, is something where so you just kind of come up with a well-chosen isotopy and you show it's both larger and smaller than the identity. Um, to prove that something is orderable, often you link that to some, some non-squeezing or squeezing phenomenon that you can deal with using generating function or homomorphic curves. And I'm going to give an example of that in an instant. Is it going to have some frequentization bundles right here? Uh, what will have some pretty Are frequentization bundles ordered? Yeah, things will that will show. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. So quickly, why do we care about this? 
Um, so I should say that at least minus my, my impression was that this thing was defined around 2000 by uh, Yasha Yashberg and Leonid Porterovich. I don't know if it was already around earlier. No, okay, we don't. Okay. Um, so, and I think one of the initial goals was to provide kind of more tools to study um, this group. So we can define, you know, some, some kind of growth function on these groups. Where, um, the fact that something is orderable means that some semi-norms actually happen to be norms. And then that gives us some tools to study these groups. Um, but so the growth function side, I don't think has been very, very much studied since then. Um, and so I'm going to go on to what I want to say later. All right, so yeah, and this is kind of where uh, this project ties into the, the special program that, that is happening this year here. So it turns out that um, on all of this, we have a conjugation action, right? So the group G acts on G tilde by conjugation. So a function, so a contact morphism G in here would send some isotopy to the conjugated one. You just conjugate it point-wise. And on, fu on functions, what does it do? So if you take the associated function to this contact isotopy, um, it will just map H to the function, so C of G, which I defined earlier there, right? This conformal factor times H, and then you can have pre-twisted by the inverse of G. So this kind of, so if you don't like any of that, you can think of this as just some kind of game that we play on functions, right? So here is, Here's an example. So let me take a function h. Um, let me forget about the time structure. I'll just take a function h that's defined on the, on the interval 0, 1. Right? Interval 0, 1 is also a contact manifold for the same reason as the circle. And um, so let me take some diffeomorphism g that, that will take this small interval there and that will stretch it into this large it over here. And then you can check that what's going to happen to the function is that it will become kind of very negative like this. So this is kind of a game you can play on, on, on functions. There's a way to move them around like that. And then, um, so here is a question we can ask is, well, we see that in this case, at least, if there's a bit that's negative, we can make it very negative. So there's kind of this general question that, um, that does there exist two functions h and h prime such that so h will be smaller than h prime, but there is no way to make h prime smaller than h um, by applying a g on it. So such that there is no g, g such that um, so we just want to flip that thing. So c g times h prime composed with g inverse. Sorry, which page. So why would we want to look at that? So on the one hand, you, can, you could see that as kind of what happens to that order if we try to restrict it to the, to kind of project it onto the conjugacy classes. This is kind of what this does, right? So it, it would show that it, the order doesn't depend on the element you choose in the conjugacy class. But more importantly, and this is kind of what ties, um, ties this to the which principle in general is that this kind of question is actually extremely important in the proof of the high dimensional uh, H principle. So in the H principle for high dimensional over twisted contact manifold. So this is a theorem of uh, um, Bormann, Elashberg and Murphy that shows that there is an H principle for high dimensional contact structures, the over twisted ones. And what they basically do is boil down the entire question to showing that um, kind of the opposite of that question that some Hamiltonians can be smaller than the other one. So this picture is kind of a proof of the H principle in three dimension. It's a hidden proof, <laughs> it does that. Um, and kind of similar, um, similar considerations can do the same in, a, in higher dimensions, but it, it is a lot more difficult. And it's kind of the point of, the, of this project kind of shed some light on what's going on over there. Right, um, how much time do I have left? Oh, actually, a couple minutes. It's better that I erase, or I can I use one of the side boards? There's another board actually. Uh, if you yeah. if you lift, uh, but I did not do it smartly. Yeah. Oh no! There, can I write on this? Yes. Yes, but well, okay. Okay. Um, right. So uh, yeah, 
Yeah, but can I just uh, they can see it. Yeah, they can see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll stick to this one. I guess I worked very hard. Okay, so uh, let me kind of give a sample theorem in, in that in that direction. So, uh, right. You know what? I will just erase this. That's fine. Because then you can see what's up there. Okay, so, but as I said, so in the proof of this H principle, they actually come up with some Hamiltonians that you can always make smaller than the other ones. So it's kind of a negative answer to that question. Um, but if you restrict to some class of Hamiltonians, um, then the, the, question, the answer is actually positive. So let me explicit this a little bit. So here is kind of a, a simple theorem that's proved. Um, so let's take the following setup. So let's take some sphere in R to N. Um, and let's take, so pi k would be a linear subspace that would be the span of the last k basis vectors, okay, the, the standard basis in, in here. And uh, let's take the contact manifold, so it's k, so it will depend on k. Um, so that thing would just be, so we take basically the whole sphere, but we remove its intersection with that subspace, and then we take the restriction of the standard contact structure on the sphere. So this looks like, okay, we're doing that. Uh, it turns out that this kind of manifold is very much related to that work I was talking about before. Um, yeah. uh, the, the, the Borman, Ayashbeck, yeah. Murphy, Murphy proof. All right, and then uh, kind of the conclusion is yes. So the answer is yes. So then uh, well, there exists H small equal to H prime, such that there is no G where CG H prime composed of G inverse or equal to H. And um, let me just give, uh, draw one picture because we need pictures um, that shows kind of what kind of ingredient goes in something like that. Um, so right, here is the picture. So what is the idea of that? So let me draw. So this is S to n minus one. And then somewhere we have this subspace pi of k that I drew earlier that we remove. Uh, I defined earlier, we remove from S to N. So the idea here is that we can, so given you know, these two H and H prime, we can associate some domains VH um, and VH prime, some domains in R to N cross S1. So this picture here lives in R to N. I drew S to N minus one as a subset of it. And uh, you kind of cross everything with S1, so we can take care of that time coordinate. Um, so this H prime is larger than this one should be in here. So we're able to find two domains like that. And the way I define um, the Hamiltonians is so that these associated domains look like this. So you would have um, two hyperboloids cross S1. Yes. That would be the one corresponding to the bigger. And then you would have another one, um, right? It would be very big. So we're able to associate these shapes and, um, and to a G such that we can Keep this order like that. We can actually associate some contact morphism of this big space I drew there. So phi capital, a contact morphism of R to N plus S1 that squeezes the big one into the small one. So, so that's capital phi of VH is in VH. All right, so if we prove that there is a non squeezing for this type of pictures here in that space, then we actually prove that uh, there exists functions like that, that for which you cannot mess up the order by conjugating. And um, well, this is a fairly classical thing to do. You can use some you know, holomorphic curves that you package into some version of contact homology, and that allows you to prove such a non-squeezing theorem. So that's, that thing kind of goes a little bit against uh, the, the proof of this edge principle that I was talking about earlier, because in their case, they show that there are some functions that, that you can make smaller than the other ones. Here, uh, I proved that for some particular functions, right? I came up with these functions that 
define that. Uh, the, these hyperboloids, you can't. And so the question is kind of to see what kind of behavior these contact Hamiltonians must exhibit so that we gain, um, so we're able to use them in the, this definition of uh, over twisted in high dimension. So that's kind of a, right? So this uses holomorphic curves, which typically are a bit more reserved to deflect to the rigid side of things. And then we're trying to see how that plays into the edge principle. So there's this question of like what's going on in there, somewhere in the middle. And uh, I think this is what I would like to think about this here. Okay, thank you. So you somehow want like this bigger one to completely enclose the spheres? No. Like the picture you've drawn, is it always like this or not, not needed? Oh, no, no, uh, it doesn't have to be. So actually what this picture is, is so if you look at uh, kind of the radial coordinates, yeah. and then so you, know, you have a function basically defined on this sphere. Um, and what these shapes are supposed to be are the graph of one over your function. And then you take everything that's before that. So why does it look like that? Is because our functions are completely supported, so they have to be zero in this region that has like the hole due to that. And so there, the function has to be zero, and so the graph is like the graph of one over that is kind of infinite, and that's why all our shapes are infinite in that direction. So this is how you construct these domains. Okay. So in general, it doesn't have to include the sphere. I mean, if, uh, if the function is like larger than one, then well, then it will be inside the sphere. The sphere has radius one. Can you explain a bit more the relationship between this continuation question and the notion of observability? Uh, uh, how does this tie up to, I guess, if you have an over twisted contact manifold, is that always orderable or not? Or oh, um, so the examples of the examples, so this dot 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 here uh, consists of over twisted three manifolds. So, but I, mean, I, I don't think there's a result that says that something is over twisted if only if it's not orderable. Um, if you're asking about the, the theorem, I'm asking the higher dimension. Say, if you have an over twisted contact manifold, is that by non observability? Uh, I did not say that. I don't think that's, I don't know. I don't think that's proven. I'm not sure. Is it true that if you have an over twisted contact manifold, same higher dimension, is that non orderable? Or is that something completely open? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and do we have examples of tight contact manifolds, which are? Well, let me propose we thank the speaker and then we continue. Yes. <laughs>